Um, I'm going to be talking today a little bit about the interactions between various Wikimedia projects and the academic environment that underpins the um, verification aspects of Wik Wikipedia articles, for instance. Um, you're probably more, than, more aware than most of the uh, unfounded academic skepticism towards ac um, Wikipedia. Um, part of what I want to do is to show people that Wikipedia is something that operates on process of verification and validation, but that actually we have processes in the academy that block that from sometimes being the most effective. So I'm talking about open access here. I'm talking about the fact that members of the public find it difficult to get access to scientific, but in my area, also scholarly journal articles. So I don't know how many people know about the open access debate and what that is in academia. OK, so a fair number of you, so I'll, I'll just give a quick cursory skim over that. Because I think what I'd like to get across to you today is the political and social challenges we face within the academy of getting this stuff out. It's not as simple as just saying to academics, well, why don't you make this stuff open? We're constrained by various processes, but I want to work out ways we can overcome that, and I'm sure that your kind of projects are the things that can help with that. So open access is the idea of removing price barriers and permission barriers to scholarly material. Um, it works for scholarly material differently to, say, literary publishing, because academics are not reliant on selling their work to um, prosper in their field. I don't get paid for any of the journal articles, books, or so forth that I write. What I get is a job at the university, who then pay me to do that work. Publishers, however, that's another matter. They make quite a lot of money off my research. Um, we can come back to that later. So this movement launched in about 2002, primarily in physics, actually, as the um, initial site there. Um, Landed on three different statements, beginning with B, you can look them up. The primary one is the Budapest Open Access Initiative statement. Um, there's a free and open culture history behind that as well, and I'm not going to go into that because I'll probably out of my depth in this room. Okay, so there are many problems with the current way we do scholarship in the academy, uh, and this is one of the foremost ones in my mind. This graph shows UK inflation at the bottom against the cost to academic libraries of having all the material we need to do our research. So one has risen by 80%, that's inflation. The other has risen by 380%. Um, most university libraries can't afford to give their researchers all the access they need to do their work. Um, and we end up doing these elaborate interlibrary loans to get access to material that we wrote in the first place. So you can probably see the craziness of this situation beginning to develop. Um, it's completely cyclical. So I write my research, and there's this thing called the REF for academics in the UK. It's the Research Excellence Framework. And I have to submit four pieces to this, and then on some arbitrary basis behind closed doors, four people get very drunk and decide what score I get, and allocate our university uh, an amount of money based on that. Um, so I'm actually quite constrained in where I can publish, because these academics have one year to read the output of every academic in their field, four outputs from them, and some of those can be books. So they're not going to read this stuff. That's the generally accepted consensus. They're going to look at the name of the place you published it. So in my field, for instance, a top journal is called Textual Practice. Now, Textual Practice is not an open publication. It's very much closed. It's run by Informa Group, who made £725 million profit in the first quarter of 2010. Aren't we all in it together? Um, nonetheless, if I want to do well in this, keep my job and excel at, come up the academic hierarchy, that's the kind of place that I have to publish. Now, there are new venues forming that start to get around this and start to think that the internet transforms the way we do this and that research should be open. However, at present, they don't carry the weight of name for the senior professors who are living in a previous era who are evaluating this stuff. And that's a very generalized statement. But that's the kind of problem that I faced and are nuts. They're absolutely crazy. But that's the game we have to play. Conversely, as I mentioned already, we can't afford our own research. So, there's some interesting things going on for, that relate to your project that I think um, need a little bit of elaboration. There are two ways that it's been proposed that we can make our research more accessible so that projects like Wikipedia or just the general interested lay public can get access to this material. The first is called green open access. And this means that every institution has its own uh, institutional repository. This runs um, ePrint software provided by um, GNU, so it's, it's open and free software. The idea of that is that when I've done, written an article and sent it to a publisher and they've accepted it, publishers accept that their practice is a little bit on dodgy ground. So to placate academics, they've said, OK, you can put the accepted version into this repository and anybody can have access. 
Sometimes they impose an embargo on that, so it might take two years before you can get access to it. However, it's substantially better than nothing. What I'd suggest that's wrong, perhaps, with this route is that Wikipedia, as far as I, I've used it, requires quite um, strong genealogies of validation. We want to know who said what and who said it was good so that the final article is trustworthy. And we have various standards in the Wikipedia guidelines for what constitutes trustworthiness. However, the green version is not necessarily the same as the final published version. We've got a versioning issue at hand here. You've also got an issue that the page numbers don't correlate to the final version in that case. So does that pose a problem? That's something that I think you, you need to be having discussions about. If more material is made available via this route, which it increasingly is, how can we ensure those chains of verification are in place? And more importantly, does it matter that they differ from a, diff a final version of the piece? It might, but is it best than nothing? The second route, which is more favorable in some ways, but less desirable in others, is called gold. And this means that when I go to textual practice, they say to me, OK, we're actually an open access publication. We're going to make the material available to everyone. Well, that's ideal, because anybody can get that without paying any extortionate fee. However, Informer Group are not keen on losing their massive revenues. So the way they're proposing to implement this is to ask me and my institution to pay £1,800 for a 6,000-word article. Now, my institution is not terribly well off. That's why we couldn't afford the stuff to buy it in the first place for our library. They're not going to give me that money to pay for it. And that's the case almost unilaterally for a large number of institutions in the UK and worldwide. So gold is flawed from a business model perspective when it's correlated with article processing charges, this mode of funding it. So <coughs> advantages to both sides, but that would be the ideal route for us to get broader inclusion of scholarly material in the public domain and make it possible to make Wikipedia and other Wikimedia resources um, a transcultural effort. Okay, so there are various business models that we could get around here, and I'm trying to think through how do we incentivize academics to publish in these new venues that do better things socially for us, and how do we do it without screwing ourselves even more badly than we are at the moment under the economic situation? So there are various ways we do this. So I run a number of journals, actually, or actually one of which is called Orbit in light of the last uh, uh, presentation, a medium of sociology journal in Australia called Foucault Studies. Where basically, because we're doing so much of this work for publishers for free anyway, the academics have turned around and said, oh, this is insane. We'll do it all. We can copy, copy edit. We can typeset. We know how we can work out to do digital preservation. We're not dim people. Um, and they've just take, gone and circumvented the middleman. The problem is this is very low scale and niche and doesn't carry that ridiculous impact game that we want for those systems of accreditation. Conversely, this is an idea that I think work on and I can get working. It's an institutional subsidy for free submission to a gold open access journal. So at the moment we've got all these libraries worldwide all paying a massive amount so they can privately rent this content that the publisher can retract at any point under DRM provisions anyway. That's not the way to do this. What those libraries should be doing is paying a small amount each to subsidise enterprises that produce high quality articles, arrange the peer review process and put these things out so that anybody can get access to them. <clears throat> You have a thousand libraries worldwide paying four hundred pounds, which is less than the cost of a single journal in my field. We would have enough to run an organisation that could make this a reality, and that is where I think I'm going to go. There are various other models which um, I'm sure you've discussed in relation to Wikimedia projects, like advertising, which are less favourable. Uh, we don't really want to be constrained criticising uh, ecological damage for all companies and find Shell right next to us. So. There are ethical problems, and then there are actually sustainability problems with the advertising model, especially for very niche fields. So that probably doesn't work. And then there are these article processing charges, which I can afford. I don't really want to afford. Um, but there are, there are some publishers, like Sage, who are experimenting with lower rates, but they're getting very low submission turnout at the moment. Like, I put in a sample article to them to work out how many they have, because they sequentially number them. They've only had about 250 this year, from what I can see. So that's not going to be sustainable for them at present. Okay, so this is sort of the plug. Are you taking questions? Yeah, I can do a question at this point. Yeah. I've, I've often searched for sources, and you come across a, like an academic source, a journal article, mm. uh, and you're just doing it for interest for Wikipedia. And the cost to actually access that article is, is ridiculous. You know, it's more than the price of a book. Right? Yeah, $40 plus per. Uh, does anyone actually pay these fees? 
No, it's envisaged that those are paid for by institutional subsidies. Um, institutional does, subscriptions. Does, does, does it even happen through that route? Do, do they actually get any income from these? They do, because what they have this technique where these really important journals we have to have, they have micro-monopolies in a way, because if there's a piece of research out there that I need to read, I don't have a choice but to get hold of it somehow. So what they say to the library is, well, we know you're going to need these really high-profile journals, but we'll only let you have them if you also buy them in conjunction with these uh, hundred other rubbish journals that we run. Oh, and by the way, you'll have to sign a non-disclosure agreement, so you can't tell other libraries what you paid for that bundle. It's hugely anti-competitive and dubious, and actually, I was in the House of Commons um, inquiry into open access recently, I fed a comment to them about this, and it was put to David Willits, who, let's face it, is not the most uh, inclined to dispute business practices, but even he was taken aback by that. So, I'm it's not great. I'm surprised the US government hasn't stopped on that. Well, I mean, it's a business technique. It's not technically illegal to enter yeah, into a contract. It's an trust thing. Well, I guess it could be, yeah. I, well, yes, I'd like them to pursue that. However, their massive international big business, um, Informa, for instance, mm -hmm. in Francis, it's very difficult to combat that practice, especially in the states where you've got a more privatized system of education and they're free to enter into whichever contract they like. So, yeah, a little bit on the insanity of the business model there. Um, let's talk about how we might gets things that's a little bit more useful to everybody concerned. So the problems are not technological in this case. And this, again, I keep feeling aligned with the things you do. All the problems are social, not technological. We can fix the technological problems. We can build things that help with the social. But primarily, it's getting people to understand how it works and see the value when you build new things and to transition them from the old way of doing things. Now, Wikipedia went for quite a radical approach of just straight away giving us a project where anybody could edit, and that obviously caused some ripples, but now is an accepted, massively accepted part of the internet ecosystem and way of doing things. In academia, I don't think that's going to work. They're hugely conservative, and they have pre-existing systems that have served them well for many years. Um, if we just build it, I don't think they'll come. However, there are ways around this. People are very scared at the moment in academia about the idea that the government might mandate them having to pay article processing charges. Now that obviously would be <coughs> dire for my, for my publishing um, career in academia, but I'm quite pleased that people are terrified. Because from that fear, we can get them on board with new ways of doing things. We can actually use the, uh, the fear of change to get them to make the change themselves, and then they've taken ownership, and then they'll do it. So we've been soliciting support from academics worldwide, Harvard, Stanford, Cambridge, um, the big prestigious places to sit on our editorial board for this project, the Open Library of Humanities. This makes it safe for anyone in academia to publish there, because these people have said, we're going to give you a paper in our first year, an article. So everyone else says, oh, well, these are the people who are going to be assessing me later in the day. So if they're publishing there, we're very hypocritical of them to mark me down for doing so. So we start to break that prestige trap. Conversely, though, I think we have some problems also with this hugely distributed system. It seems slightly strange to me in this day and age that we pre-sort our articles into these niche areas, like potential practice or the <coughs> Journal of uh, Obscure Political Theory Studies. Um, we have facilities to retrieve and search and, um, and bury things that are not currently relevant without excluding them totally from the ecosystem. So what I'm saying here is that our current systems of peer review limits what gets into the, the article pool in the first place. When I send my article off, someone will judge the importance of that to the field. Now, who are they to say that 20 years from now that might not be extremely important to our cultural understanding of this era? None of us can say from within our point what is going to be important down the line. So I suggest we also need to think, in line with an initiative called PLOS in the sciences, about the way in which we limit material, and that instead of pre-selecting what goes in, we should let more through and then filter. People can search for what's important. So as long as it passes certain standards of technical correctness, so as long as this stuff is fundamentally right, why should its importance be the fact that it stops it ever getting out there? Sure, we can rank it afterwards so we get these ridiculous game-playing exercises, but let's not preclude it entirely. However, academics, again, don't like that. They're fond of their branded place that they feel they've been loyal to their whole career and it's worked. So the way I'm thinking of getting around this is we have this idea of overlay journals, where say I, at the moment I edit a journal and it's for a commercial entity. Instead of doing that anymore, I say I'm going to work for this project, the Open Library of Humanities, and I'm going to use my nominal authority in that area to curate every six months 
what I think are the top 10 articles in my very niche field, and it will be branded in that way. So that's a social mechanism to overlay on top of this big pot. So we can have the pot where everybody can search for these open articles and find them. And then we have the academics saying, I know my stuff here, this is the good stuff in this area. So you get multiple levels of validation, and you get explicit validation from the nominal authority of the academic who said so. Which I think increases the process of transparency, because at the moment, let's say you cite an article on a Wikipedia article, you don't actually know who peer reviewed that in many cases. Um, that's changing in some scientific disciplines, but certainly in the humanities it's double blind, and I will never know in some cases who reviewed my article. How is that telling us how trustworthy that article is? Surely we're looking actually at a transitional stages of validation and authority here. So I think that opening that up in that way and having curation could be another layer of validation. There are also various nifty things we can do for teaching and research projects with these overlay journals and print on demand. Um, I don't actually want to see the PDF. Yeah, two, one minute. Two, yeah, two, yeah. I don't actually want to see the PDF completely die, by the way. Um, I feel <laughs> a little, probably going to get shot down for saying that, but I'm a little bit paper centric in some ways. Um, so that's just a brief summary of some of the challenges that we face in the academic community trying to get material available so projects like Wikimedia Initiatives can get access and build better things. What I'm keen to do though is to try and think about ways in which academics can be incentivized to publish openly and then to collaborate in ensuring that their knowledge is integrated into projects like Wikipedia. Because we need to show impact and we need to show public engagement now as part of the things we're assessed on. And it strikes me there is one project that really brings that all together and can help with it. So this is a dialogue opening scenario, and I hope I've shown you some of the problems, but potential routes we might take to start fixing it. Thank you. <laughs> one question. Thank you, yeah, I think we we'll have one time for one very brief question, if anyone has one. Mike, if you want to. Uh, Shout. Yeah. So in astronomy, we've got systems of the archive, which we use for uh, free prints, distributing everywhere, and also we've got NASA's um, abstract database system for um, collating up all the journal articles. Is it not similar to that already in the humanities? Or Absolutely not. It's, again, insane. There are no preprint services in the humanities. Um, most humanities scholars are very reticent to put their work in any form online before it's been validated by the publisher for fear it will be pulled. But also there's this, this cult of the lone individual romantic scholar, preferably in a dark tower on a stormy night, who comes out with the final piece that is the work of genius. That's very much the ideology we're thinking about here, and it's difficult to break it. Um, a guy called Paul Kirby at Sussex is thinking about doing a social science repository for international relations. Um, there is a very large social sciences repository online, I believe. There are. He wants to do a more a niche, niche version to overlay it. Um, but in the humanities, as opposed to social sciences and hard sciences, no, repositories are just dead in the water at the moment. Yeah,